I was attracted to Grocon mainly due to the fact it was a similar sort of company as yeah. um, Fletcher's where it was self-performing many, many of their own activities. Yeah. Well, they don't CBD type works back? Oh, Fletcher's no, or uh, Grocon. 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 Absolutely. They were, Rialto was finished, but right. we were starting to build and we, Grocon as a company had picked up a couple of major projects such as 120 Collins Street, 101. Um, there was a big uh, shift in the industry. Uh, they had the the Big Ten, which were 101, 120, Burke Place, Melbourne Central, 333 Collins Street. Um, and there was a couple of others that were on the in the pipeline at the time. So all of a sudden, Melbourne was moving into this high-rise construction yeah, yeah. model. What was your competition? Grocon's competition back then was uh, Civil and Civic. Yeah, can't. Um, Contain or, um, oh, I forget a lot yeah, of the yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, no. <laughs> businesses come and go yeah, or yeah. get absorbed. Not many that are still around now, though. No, and, and unfortunately, that, that that's part of the changing market. When you watch over the five decades, if you like, you're watching companies grow and equally come, come yeah. to an end of their uh, tenure, if you like, yeah. as a... Um, as, as a force, as an identity. Uh, yes, they change brand names, uh, they grow into different yeah. companies, but their culture changes. And, and that's due to uh, marketing uh, contract contract conditions and the likes. But at the time, in the 80s, we, we entered into, um, we were recognised as, as a very good builder and, mm. and Grocon had built Rialto, um, Park Hyatt, just to name a few. Yeah, yeah. There were quality buildings. And I was fortunate to join at a time where uh, innovation and design strategies and, and the fact that they were building for themselves as well. 120 was um, a joint venture uh, uh, development with the Packer family and the Grillo family and a few yep. others. So it was their own money. And that gave you a, um, an in, a different insight on how this was going to be built. There were permit issues. There were lots of um, problems associated with getting a development off the ground like this. But it was going to be the tallest building in Melbourne at the time. And it, it, it became the tallest building in Melbourne, 120. It competed amongst ourselves with 101 and a few others, but mm. 120 Collins Street was innovative in, in the way we built the structure, the way we managed the um, design mm -hmm. and the program. The, uh, it was interesting when, you, when I'm starting to think about yeah. uh, building 120, we, we were having self-climbing screens uh, we carried our own formwork. We we put five cranes on the site, concrete pumps on the site. We sort of overcooked our own mm. thinking. But this is in the 80, late 80s. We had jump lifts. We had self-climbing screens. We, we created hybrid structures where we were um, using steel floors and metal decks and in situ edge conditions. We managed... Um, uh, we were forced to manage differential settlement. All of these things that were not very mm. much on the forefront of construction because of uh, uh, nobody yeah, was yeah. really building anything over 30, 30 odd floors. Mm. So we're now into this building of 50 floors, 55, 60 floors in, in height. So cranage strategy, all the rest of it was coming into play, and uh, which is very common today. Mm. but. It's um, these were large span structures yeah, yeah, yeah. and the like. So it, it was an exciting period, and we successfully delivered those jobs. And um, from there, I went from sort of site manager to project manager under Brian Fitzmorris, who was a an absolute gem of a man that um, I suppose helped take some. Uh, Somebody might, you know, people might still think I've got plenty of rough edges, but a lot of rough edges off my approach and yeah. construction and professionalism. And uh, 
he, he, he was a mentor, a friend, and my boss. Yeah. So he, he, was, he was a magic man. And after building 120 Collins Street, it won all the awards, Builder, Builder of the Year, um, OH&S Standards. Um, it was recognised for all mm. sorts of um, achievements. And which adds, at, the, um, at that particular time, in the construction industry, the OH&S Acts were just being implemented mm -hmm. and being enforced. We had uh, we were probably the first um, central building or the built uh, in the city to have a nurse and first aid mm -hmm. structures. So we set all those process, processes up. We ran very strict, um, not toolbox meetings they were called or um, uh, work method statements, but we we started to create them yeah, yeah. by default by managing our own people. The safety of our people were paramount. Uh, so all of those things were being developed. And, and it's a pleasure to see how they yeah. have grown and, and, and also, how they've been manipulated by certain elements of the industry, not to mention unions or anything like that, mm. but uh, how safety can be used both on a positive and ne negative mm. aspects in, in the sites. So, 120, uh, that was a couple of years of your life, and you know, the building's there. It's, uh, it took a lot of changes. We had to stop and redesign it as we were building. We had the central core. 32 levels above the floor plates because of a design change to bring a tenant in. Mm -hmm. um, that created a lot of problems technically and structurally with differential settlements. We, we, we were just about up the top and we um, agreed and implemented a, a uh, communication tower on it. So again, change is happening. So we were managing change and time and, and cost strategically all the way through that job. We were able to then, I was able to then go down to ANZ in uh, Queen Street and the museum and, and basically take control of all the facade elements and work closely and in partnership with Permasteel and took control of the external elements of the building, yep. which again taught, you know, you just keep learning, you, you keep understanding structure, Facades, working with Permasteel, I basically ran their business yeah. in conjunction with them to support the delivery of the project. All of these jobs had extremely difficult challenges associated with them, whether it was um, the details, the connections, the selection of the materials or how they were um, uh, packaged. Uh, and coordination of planning was... Yeah. Paramount. But as we went through there, um, Rocon um, had some some political issues, I guess, to say, um, through um, the media, through um, the ATO, all of these things were being publicly made about um, the company. Um, going back to Rialto, uh, we were pricing the project for uh, ESSO at the time and uh, they didn't like what they were hearing about us and we were sort of yeah. pushed away a little bit because they were perceiving we weren't a good citizen yet they just about destroyed Alaska at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, and the family was proven to be okay and correct. So, yeah. we, you know, it was a tough time for the family in construction, but we were looking at the direction going forward and fortunately Casino was coming along and we were able to um, put ourselves in a position yeah. to, as a company, to take on the temporary Casino. Well, I personally got seconded through agreement and discussions to work with Hudson Conway and Crown directly and to work with the design teams and the pre-planning and establishing a, the, the, both the structural strategy to deliver the building, which was um, a brief that it needed to be developed to meet 
a timeline to make change and, and to um, uh, deliver certainty. Yep. The casino was a project that uh, was in the order of a billion dollars worth of construction that we were handling. Um, so certainty and outcome was a major consideration, but it also um, needed time to be designed and developed up. And when I went across with Hudson Conway and Crown, we were fortunate to put together a very competent crew of people, um, to name a few like Lou Rawnick, Mark Prentice, and many others to help put that strategy together and, and tackle the uh, early works as of the relocation of primary services yeah. that were feeding the city, the stability and understanding of the flood protection of South Melbourne into the Yarra through the site, uh, the, the management strategy around excavating uh, King Street Bridge, yeah. building a structure that you couldn't retain, uh, put a put a retaining wall up against the Yarra so you could have actually lost the site yeah. <laughs> uh, through the Yarra at some site because you were building in Coot Island silt. And uh, it was an extremely exciting and challenging time. And uh, we'd done that, I think, very successfully. We put together also a um, the piling package, which, is, which had over a thousand board piers and multiple numbers of um, driven piles as an early works package managed under Hudson Conway Crown yeah. that I played a part in. Once the head contract was awarded to Grocon, I went back to Grocon, worked on the western end uh, and around King Street Bridge, to, which became a bit of a passion to mine to make yeah. sure it, that sort of works. You know, I guess that was a highly successful project. A oh, very successful project. What, uh, the people who were on that project obviously made it successful, but what was it about the people at Grocon back then that made that project successful, do you think? Because... A good question, and, and I think that um, not only then, and then I, I look at, and I'll name the jobs, uh, 120 Collins Street, ANZ, Melbourne Casino, uh, Melbourne's, uh, Melbourne University Square in Carlton, yeah. QV, MCG, Amy Park. Yeah. Now, I was involved in all of those jobs, not fully on QV, but at a stage there between completion of uh, Melbourne University Square and the MCG. But what made Grocon special it was there was no individual there. there it was a team. Yeah. Uh, a lot of guys spent a long time with the business. Oh, look, it was a team. And, and we all had ego. Like, <laughs> it was a competition and um, in, in an indirect way. It was uh, the ability to also um, be innovative, be supportive, um, maintain your honesty and yeah, integrity. Yeah. All these things that you hear people talk about, we had it. We had honesty. We had integrity. We respected one another. We, we showed a bit of love to one another. So and when yeah. we could be professional, we were professional. Yeah. And, and but we always had the ownership of design, the detail, the sequencing, the programs, and the cost. Yeah. And um, from my point of view, like. I worked together with people like the crew that built the MCG. We were, we had worked together for 20 years. Mm. So we had people that there was no role description. Yeah. We, we battled with who was the boss. Mm. What do you call the boss? You know, we had uh, uh, site managers that were called construction managers. Yeah. You know, so if you look at that today, it's yeah, all a different. bit back to the front. Yeah. We, we invented or used executive project managers so that we could um, structure ourselves a bit yeah. for minute taking and yeah, the yeah, likes. Yeah. And it was, it was never a title was not the game. And uh, the game was the building. 
yeah. and you own the building and and it was your business inside the hoarding and and it was like it was your business it was my money it was my responsibility yeah. it was my ownership and and the the Grollo family gave you that uh responsibility and and gave you the support it wasn't easy mm -hmm. far from it um and and you you needed honesty you needed integrity you needed trust and uh they gave it to you yeah not like a corporate body and that's no disrespect to corporate bodies because we were just a group of people i i can tell you when i was delivering the MCG at one stage there we were dying we were, we were going backwards 100 miles now yeah. there was uh, if you took the program we weren't going to finish until about now <laughs> <laughs> you know 10 years later if you looked at where the program was heading in the first 18 months we're in from a program point of view or a perception point of view against the planning and, and the volume we we look like we would never make it. Yeah, and in theory, by following uh, critical paths, determination, life, we were, yeah. but we knew the way we were building it, and the way we were um, going about it, we would turn it around. We were being, you know, people. I can remember a comment, and I couldn't tell you who it was from, but it was certainly said that you know we were the wogs from Preston. We're the worst builders in 150 years. We'll never finish the job. We'll have to bring the army in. You know, th this is in the first 18 months. And, you know, and we had to take a lot of criticism, a, a lot of challenges in to show cause, not necessarily contractually to show cause, but demonstrate that we could uh, prove, prove and deliver the project. And that surely was about uh, volume and how it started, how we had to build it. And it's an interesting case study when you look at it in, in programming and, and, and construction management and site management and, and contracting because it did turn around yeah. after the first 18 months, uh, two years. You know, if anybody did want to see how we'd go, we'd just say, take a photo, yeah. we're there. And uh, we did, we finished it very early. In, in the sense of um, the program time. We also delivered it, um, I suppose, about a month or two months in advance uh, as uh, for the AFL. Uh, a lot of that was driven by myself because it was I wanted to open it for Anzac Day. I'm <laughs> a pretty one-eyed Collingwood supporter and always have been. And so <laughs> I wanted Collingwood to be at the um, uh, first AFL game no. to be played there, so it was. If it wasn't Anzac Day, it would have been another Collingwood home game. But um, that was an agenda, no. um, and that just that desire to achieve and and deliver something was uh, the MCG just gave you that. It was ingrained into the property, yeah. it was the psyche of the place. So the culture was just so strong, and. We built confidence, we built belief, and uh, we trusted one another. And, and when you look at um, construction, it's not about the roles or the, it is a team. Mm. You know, but I spell team with eyes. Mm. So uh, somebody's got to lead, somebody's got to um, uh, take the full responsibility of the decisions that come out of it. And that's what you put your hand up for and that's what you do. Yep. And then most of those guys went across to Amy Park for the post MCG, or uh, no? Because there was a lot there that the core did. Yeah, the core did. Amy Park was an interesting get. Uh, MCG was more a, um, I think, again, a bit like the casino. Uh, yes, yeah, you could play. It. John Holland's built the Southern Stand, but the journey is a, the certainty and the staging. And, and the resources were the best mm. goal that people believe Graycon would bring. And but Amy Park was something different. Amy Park was we were bidding at the time. I I was working with Graycon and Plenary putting a bid in for um, the children's hospital, 
and um, we missed out on that. Uh, as probably everybody yeah, yeah. knows. So second prize was going to be Amy Park, and you know you should only ever build one stadium. You should never do two. Um, but Amy Park, the design, the uh, challenge, sort of grabbed me mm. because of the uniqueness of it. But it was not documented. It was presented through uh, a model. Uh, Good architecture, uh, but structurally we put on a model. It was a job that was very, very difficult to um, measure and um, cost. So we worked closely with the government to put uh, as an EOI, if you like, as an early works uh, involvement. But that was that led more to capacity, future pure proofing and the likes. So again, we were properly ideally placed because of our own uh, management structure and our own um, ability to be a vertically integrated company. Yeah. So we started it on the... Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I started it before a contract was signed. If I, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. then, you know, like, that's not good corporate practice for a start. Uh, you know, I don't think, um, w look, we were, with the government, we were pretty comfortable we'd get there. Yeah. But time was ticking, so we, as a business, we took the incentive to start and then have a bit of faith in what we were negotiating and where yeah. we were heading. Uh, because the design wasn't moving and the design was at no stage able to be um, tendered yep. into trade packages or externally or to um, fabricators or any subcontract. Mm. The documents just weren't there to um, give certainty to pricing and, and procurement. But the time was ticking so we, we, we just got in there and started to build. That resulted us in um, breaking the packages down where we were off-site manufacture was broken out as a package and and managed. For example, the shells or the st uh, structural steel was, there was five structural steel suppliers. We done the, uh, managed the shop detailing and the design and all the installation, including flat packing all the panels, the glazing and the solid panels of the roof and manufacturing of our own labours on site. So. Everything was being done on site, yep. and we just used the supply chain to supply the site. There was so many different challenges. We, we were 90 days behind program at certain stages. We had to manipulate um, design initiatives. We couldn't anchor the um, structure, the, the, the shelves to the concrete. Uh, the challenges were enormous. and. Uh, that was being engineered as we went. Arabs, who the engineers were absolutely fantastic, but like all builders and engineers and architects, there were errors in mm. and omissions in some of their works. Uh, but we had a, um, a partner in charter that was attached to uh, the contract, which was a really powerful document. It was a document that described how we would behave and um, Sean Sweeney of Major Projects was the driver of that particular document. And, and in all my time in construction, that was the most powerful piece of paper that I have ever worked mm. with because it, 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 by the fact that the government, the Grollos, myself, the engineers, the architects, a couple of um, uh, the senior managers in Grocon that were on the site, the Andrew Poultons, the um, who else, Frank Trinke, uh signed this mm. document. So we all took ownership mm. of behaviour. And that's a pretty tough yeah. thing to do. And um, 
ultimately it cost me my job, I think, at um, Grocon. Uh, not that um, my time had finished there yeah. because the industry was changing. I become a round peg in a square hole. <laughs> uh, I don't mind that. I think, uh, anyway, there, there, there's views on on the company as it goes forward and of the past. But uh, to me, it was just the, the Grollo family were just an outstanding group of people to be able to work with and work for. All the generations. And certainly supported me with Mo at least over a 30-year yeah, period, so they're just a great organisation to work 